Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to this IJC webinar on representing children. Um, we're very excited uh, for this program. My name is Chris Zoya. I'm the communications manager at IJC, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to what is going to be uh, a very interesting conversation about working with kids in immigration law. Uh, as some of you may be aware, this year IJC launched a new program within its Justice Fellowship called the Unaccompanied Children Program, um, which trains young immigration lawyers to, uh, to represent unaccompanied kids who are one of the most vulnerable members of, uh, of the immigrant community. And as we embark on this new initiative, we're so happy to have two IJC alumni who have years of experience working with kids uh, here to share their stories. Um, it goes without saying that the, the demand for good uh, immigration attorneys is incredibly high, especially for kids. So this is a timely topic. And uh, we, thank, we thank our alumni and, and everyone for being with us today. Uh, just some quick housekeeping before we get started. This event will be recorded so that those who aren't able to attend can watch it later on IJC's website and on our social channels. Uh, if attendees have questions, please submit them in the question and answer box. Uh, the webinar will last until 1.30. We'll have about 45 minutes of a panel discussion with our speakers, whom you'll get to know very well shortly. And uh, at the end, we'll save about 10 minutes for questions from the audience. And as a, as a reminder, this webinar is part of a series that IJC is doing, spotlighting the achievements of our alumni, many of whom occupy positions of leadership across the immigration space. Um, and if you'd like, like to check out some of our previous webinars, you can find uh, those recordings on our website. So uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Jojo Annabelle, our moderator and IJC's executive director. Uh, welcome again, everyone. Thanks for joining. Chris, thank you so much for organizing this webinar. Hello, everyone, and welcome to IJC's third alumni webinar series on representing unaccompanied immigrant children in removal proceedings. Every year, thousands of immigrant children and youth, many fleeing domestic and gang violence in their home countries, enter the United States seeking safety and protection. After harrowing journeys, they are arrested by Customs and Border Protection officials. Children under 18 years of age, traveling without a parent or legal guardian, are classified as unaccompanied children and released into the custody of the Office for Refugee Resettlement, ORR. The children are immediately placed in removal or deportation proceedings. In removal proceedings, they do not have the benefit of appointed counsel, to assist them to navigate the complicated removal process. Having counsel makes a tremendous difference. With counsel, 88% of children in removal proceedings have successful outcomes. Without counsel, only 9% are successful. There are currently more than 120,000 children in proceedings across the country who do not have counsel. Last year, Immigrant Justice Corps partnered with the Vera Institute of Justice, Acacia Center for Justice, and OR to close the representation gap for unaccompanied children. In September 2023, we will welcome 63 new lawyers to provide quality, child-centered lawyering to unaccompanied children. In September 2024, we will welcome more than 100 new lawyers to work with children. We are offering language access and supports to fellows who are not fluent in Spanish and other languages. So this afternoon, I'm privileged to welcome two IJC alums, Stephanie Cordero and Alex Holtzman, to discuss their experience working with unaccompanied children during their fellowship and post-fellowship. Stephanie was a member of our inaugural 2014 Justice Fellow class and has for the past two years served as the director of the Immigrants' Rights and Advocacy Project at Brooklyn Law Service, Legal Services. Alex was a 2016 Justice Fellow and has for the past four years served as a professor of law and director of the Deportation Defense Clinic at Hofstra Law School. Alex and Stephanie, welcome. So in 2014, Immigrant Justice 
for exclusively focused on increasing the quantity and quality of immigration representation, opened its doors to recruit, train, and mentor recent law school and college graduates to assist low-income immigrants fighting deportation, seeking lawful status and citizenship. Stephanie and Alex, can you each share why you decided to join the fellowship program and why you chose to work exclusively with unaccompanied children? Sure, thank you. So I'll, I'll get started. Um, thank you so much for the invite. It's such a pleasure being here. I will share my story. So I'm an immigrant from Quito, Ecuador. Uh, I grew up in Jackson Heights in Queens. And I took an interest in the immigration field generally because of my background um, and being a native Spanish speaker. It seemed like an area where my contributions would be very needed and valuable. And growing up as part of the immigrant community in Queens, it was evident to me that getting an education and having access to a legal degree was not a given. And I felt privileged and like I had a duty to use my law degree as a tool to serve and empower um, members of my community. Um, and so through IJC, which was a Gatson at the time and still continues to be, um, it was the first fellowship of its kind to be able to offer us a position, a staff attorney position in immigration coming out of law school, which is not uh, really available. Usually you need at least two years experience or one year experience. Um, and it was a uh, no brainer for me that I wanted to apply and be part of this cohort um, and eventually did apply and was selected as a fellow in 2014 and was placed at the Legal Aid Society and specifically the Immigrant Youth uh, Project there. And so I was placed there and continued to be there for the next seven years of my career from 2014 to 2021 uh, because it was such a rewarding job to be able to do that and particularly special to me because I came to the United States when I was 11 years old. Um, so I was myself an immigrant child um, in completely different circumstances than the clients that I was seeing. But to me, it was like coming full circle, being able to assist children who came to the United States looking for better opportunities and escaping violence many times. Um, but now in a capacity as an attorney, um, it was really, uh, I cherish the fact that I was there not just representing and assisting clients in seeking immigration relief, but also as a mentor, as a role model for my clients to see that somebody like them could come to become a lawyer in the United States, learn English and go through that process. And so, so it was very special to me, very rewarding. And so from being placed there, that's why I stayed for that long. Thank you, Stephanie. Alex? Um, so I similarly um, applied to IJC for personal and professional reasons. For personal, uh, my mom is an immigrant from Serbia. Um, and so a lot of us, I think, probably a lot of us on this call have a personal family story. Um, and so I saw firsthand problems that my mom had in this country. She was an ESL teacher on the East Coast. When we moved to the Midwest, you know, uh, she was criticized for, quote unquote, not speaking English the right way because she had an accent and, and wasn't able to get an ESL job anymore in the Midwest. Um, so there were some personal re re uh, reasons that opened up my eyes to issues in the immigration system. But really, I studied abroad and learned Spanish while I was in college. And when I came back um, to the U.S., I wanted to, to utilize this new skill. And I started doing outreach to migrant farm camps as part of a local um, law office, um, uh, screening clients for relief and documenting civil rights abuses. And I, frankly, I was appalled by the conditions I saw in the camps. And it really opened up my eyes to um, a different immigrant experience than my mom and, and, and that side of the family had encountered. And, and similar to Stephanie, I wanted to give back. I saw it as kind of something you can't unsee that you need to kind of you know, make a decision at that point in your life, how you want to spend your career. And um, uh, so ultimately that led me to apply to IJC. And then I worked at Safe Passage Project uh, where I represented unaccompanied children and, and separated children during the Trump administration largely. Um, and, uh, and as we'll talk about later, really saw 
you know, um, some some challenging stories from clients who who had been through tremendous trauma um, and braved journeys to the U.S. to seek a better life and, and was excited to do that work. And part of the reason I was excited to represent children. Now, now I have two of my own, two daughters, three and one. But even then I knew, you know, I um, I liked working with children and it was an opportunity to to um, to bring some change in um, in children's lives at an early stage to hopefully have them set up for some of those brighter futures that Stephanie referred to. Thank you, both of you. Um, so as newly minted lawyers in 2014 and 2016, what were some of the challenges you encountered working with children and how did you overcome those challenges? Any of you can start. Sure, I can, I can start this one. I guess we can trade off, Stephanie, if you'd like. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's not, uncommon with all clients, but particularly working with, with kids and, and with teenagers, with young people, um, you know, I think a greater degree of flexibility is required um, in a couple different ways. So one, um, you know, teenagers have a lot going on in their lives. They're, they're trying to figure out who they want to be, um, uh, how they fit into the world. And frankly, showing up to a lawyer's office to talk about the worst things that ever happened to them is not something I think anyone um, looks forward to doing and particularly young people. And so um, avoiding what what I often call disaster fatigue, I think working with young people is important. You know, I felt a little bit like, you know, immigration proceedings, removal proceedings are like the Hunger Games where everything, you know, you're constantly saying, you got to go to family court or we're going to lose this SIG case. You got to go to immigration court or you could be ordered removed in your absence. Um, it's so important you show up to this client meeting because we're going to draft your affidavit to tell your story. But in the aggregate, I think for young people, it's kind of like, man, my lawyer is a little bit of a, you know, he's always worried about stuff, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and so how, how do you, you know, keep things positive and, and you know, keep your sense of humor, work with kids in a way that they're, you know, um, at least not dreading coming to your office to kind of prepare next steps. Um, so being flexible about how you spend your meeting time, maybe, you know, talk about, things that they're interested in music and, and, and sports or whatever that might be early on in a meeting and then move to the more serious legal parts. And then other flexibility things I'd encourage folks to think about is, um, you know, with adult clients, you might be a little bit more strict about showing up um, on time or providing kind of notice of, of missing meetings with young people. Sometimes you have to be a little bit more flexible and, and I'd encourage folks to kind of think about that. And sometimes things come up, they can't get a ride and, and try to give your, your um, young clients some leeway there. Um, but it can frankly create some challenges from a scheduling standpoint when you have a large caseload. And so you want to develop relationships of respect with clients where they respect your time. They try, you know, they show up um, and, and they're ready with kind of their homework. You, you did your legal research and drafting case preparation, but maybe they need to come and bring evidence. So they respect your time, but also you're flexible in, um, uh, in meeting clients where they are. So a couple couple challenges would be coping with trauma um, that, that your clients have experienced and being sensitive to those issues, being flexible and building a relationship with your client. And then once you have that relationship, holding clients accountable in a respectful way to, you know, show up on time and engage in their case um, uh, to move things forward are a couple of challenges. And, and I think I sprinkled some solutions in there too. Yeah, I think a lot of what Alexander said was also my experience. Um, I want to also focus on an extra challenge that I was not necessarily prepared for coming out of law school. Um, and that's the responsibility that we have as attorneys for children of conducting safety assessments and making sure that as we are hearing information about not just what they went through in their home countries, but how they're living in the United States, that we are equipped to know what next steps to take and how that is different than say a mandated reporter who's supposed to report these uh, things or um, risky home situations, uh, unsafe home situations. And um, navigating that line between being in a position as an adult, um, as a lawyer to have to conduct a safety assessment, but at the same time represent clients directly as opposed to substituting your judgment uh, or 
breaking confidentiality to, you know, call um, ACS. I've, I've never had to do that. Thankfully, we had social workers uh, to help us navigate through that. Um, but that was definitely something that was new. Um, but at the same time, working with children, it has to be part of the skill set that you build to be able to do this work well. Um, and so I understood it as my role. I feel a lot more comfortable with it now. And it certainly helped to have colleagues who were highly experienced working with children at the Legal Aid Society. And we relied a lot on the juvenile rights practice for best tips and guidance on how to deal with these situations ourselves without breaking confidentiality, but also ensuring that the clients that we're meeting are safe and able to focus on their cases. Um, so I think that was a challenge. Um, and maybe wanting to be paternalistic in that sense, but I think my biggest takeaway was understanding that children and minors have agency um, and sort of um, as much as possible trying to understand that um, and work through the, navigate these situations with that understanding as opposed to immediately have, you know, two adults, ourselves and the parents talk about what should happen for the minor client um, without, and, and losing maybe that that client's voice. Um, so my focus has always been that, and it was a challenge at first because you're not used to it. Um, but yeah, there's certainly a way to do it um, in a way that feels like you are looking out for their safety, but at the same time being and giving them or allowing them to, for their voice to be heard, which is a really important job of an attorney working with a child, I think. Thank you both of you for sharing because for many new lawyers who are entering this field, the question always comes back to us, how, you know, like what are some of the challenges and how am I going to navigate it? And so um, what you're offering this afternoon is very important. So my next question is, so we all work on so many cases and change so many lives during the process. But I also believe that there are some cases that stick in our minds. So I'm just wondering without any of you sharing confidential information, if you can share a case from your fellowship that you're most proud of. I guess we're unofficially going back and forth. So the audience gets to hear different people first. So I'll, I'll yeah, it's really hard to pick one, especially after doing the work for so long and working with this wonderful population. But I will focus on um, the case of a client who was an Ecuadorian girl. So off the bat, I felt like I could really relate um, to the client coming into a new country. And in many ways, like I mentioned, also not relate um, because of her history of abuse, both sexual and physical, um, and working with the client through discussing those details was um, absolutely difficult. But at the same time, it's something we needed to do, particularly because the client wasn't eligible for special immigrant juvenile status. And so what we had to do was apply for asylum, which can be so invasive. Um, and it is so invasive um, in the process. And so why this stood out to me was because the client was also my age when she got to the United States. So just at 11 years old, I was working with her. Um, she was revealing uh, sexual abuse to me for the first time. Um, so again, it took connecting her with services and navigating uh, how much to tell her mother if she was ready for it or not to then, but also having to get, provide her or connect her with the services that she needed to process what had happened to her. Um, but I think why this stands out is because eventually, you know, she we did get her asylum at the asylum office. Um, and she was really excelling in school. I just saw how resilient she was despite her past. You would never know. She was doing so well in high school. She got an internship because she wanted to be a veterinarian one day and worked at a veterinary clinic. Um, and eventually I finally got her green card and um, from being an SILE. And um, I had to call her and ask her like, how do you want me to get this to you? By this time she was already 18. Um, and, you know, she gives me her address upstate where she was going to college already. And I, you know, I, I had to write out the dormitory address. So it was really amazing to see how far she had gotten. 
the fact that she was in college, she learned English for the first time here. Um, and it was just so powerful to see and very humbling to see that I could be a part of that, that she just had so much potential, had everything, um, really it was all her, but the fact that I was able to play a small part in ensuring that legal status is not a barrier to her fulfilling her full potential, um, it just felt amazing. And it felt great to also see how, you know, her past and, and getting status is just gonna be such a small part of the amazing life that she'll have. So it's both really, rewarding and also humbling and um to see that we can be part of that and that their lives will continue and they'll just be amazing so it really touched me in this case that that's a great story stephanie and, and i think um it is so important for everyone to think through if you're thinking about applying to ijc you know this is really life-changing work for your clients that um you know that i think we can really go home at night knowing that we we played a small but important role in um in furthering you know people's lives and careers and that's that's just that's really meaningful um i i like to tell my students to avoid the savior complex and think your client is the hero of their story and you're a guide to show them the way you help them figure out you know um their immigration court proceedings and and what applications they need to fill out but ultimately your clients have lived through this trauma have to testify about it. Our work can be re-traumatizing. And so, um, you know, ultimately our role is to is to help our clients get to that next step, right? Maybe it's maybe it's that legal status to get into college, for instance. So um uh that's that's a great example, Stephanie. Mine, mine is somewhat similar. Um, I represented a young person from El Salvador at Safe Passage Project, um, who um was forced to drop out of school very young and work in the fields. Um and uh, had pesticide issues from that and had to use a machete at a young age and had some kind of very minor injuries from that, but hadn't had the chance to go to school, uh, but he loved art. And he would draw all the time during our meetings. He, he would come and kind of, he, he actually brought me a picture that I have in my office here. Um, uh, and, and so he wanted to be an artist. Unfortunately, he um, had a very difficult judge in family court, which was a prerequisite for applying for special immigrant juvenile status or SIG. And, and this judge really put this client through the ringer. I mean, would, you know, uh, ask him to come back and back to court, even during testimony, which often are um, are unopposed hearings. So nobody is, is on the other side, because in his case, his father had consent, uh, consented for his brother to be his guardian in the U.S., um, and so no one was really opposing it. His mother had already passed away, um, but the judge kind of took it upon himself um, to object during testimony kind of over and over again while this client, you know, who's, who's a young teenager is like sweating, right? And and it's like, tell it, you know, um, why are you scared to go back to El Salvador? And the judge is like, objection, like speculation, right? And it's like, no, that's, you know, respectfully, Your Honor, this is like a foundational question, right, of, 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 of the child's best interest, right? And so really, I'm, I, I just remember the client coming out, you know, of court, like trenched in sweat, had been really put through the ringer. Fortunately, um, we, we were successful in that case and we did um, get get the special findings order that we needed, apply for um, SIG status after after what, what took months. And actually just a couple um, weeks ago, the client reached out to me. He had since moved to um, Maryland. And, and another happy story about IJC is, you know, you make a lot of contacts, right? And and I was able to refer his case to a friend who's in Maryland who could pick up the rest of um, uh, the case and finish out the final um, follow-up for the green card application. And the client was successful in getting that green card um, and it, and is still still working on his art. And so for me, that was, that was a great experience of just seeing how much adversity a client with a very meritorious case had to overcome to win SIG, to get his green card, to go forward and and our clients really do go on to do great things, including, you know, I have a client who's working at Google now and, um, and again, you know, um, this talented artist and, and a lot of clients who really um, do great work. So, so for me, that, that was a meaningful, um, a meaningful case. Jojo, I think you're on mute. Thank you both of you for sharing two of your stories. I know um, it's difficult to pick because all of our clients are deserving and the stories are many. Oftentimes you're on the subway and suddenly someone is calling out your name 
and it's a client you helped probably five, six years ago and you'd forgotten about them and so much, so much joy. So um, you talked a bit about trauma. It, we all know that immigration practice can be draining because of the high stakes and also constantly hearing about your clients' harrowing stories. So how did each of you take care of yourself during the fellowship? And how did you handle vicarious trauma as uh, it came about? I guess, I guess I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, th this is, this is a real issue and one everyone sh should take seriously um, as an attorney, particularly as an immigration attorney. So of course our clients e experience a variety of different trauma. The immigration court system can be traumatizing, pr particularly for young people. And then whatever the reasons why they came to the U S they might've experienced trauma as Stephanie talked about earlier with her client in home country, they might fear um, harm um uh if they if they're removed to their home country and so um additionally you're gonna as an attorney just hear a lot of terrible things i mean we should just say it up front right and you're gonna you're gonna have to see a lot of terrible things as well sometimes there are photos of victims scars um and and you're just you know one challenge with working with young people is it's really hard on on a daily basis to hear about some of the worst things that happen to children right that's difficult. And you should think now early in your career about what you can do to prepare yourself for how you're going to unwind in ideally a healthy way. Right. And so, you know, if you have an exercise routine, how are you going to schedule that in just like you would schedule any work meeting in, right. Schedule in your exercise. I'm trying to get better about that myself now. And, and, you know, uh, hitting an exact time where, where you can do that to unwind and then think for yourself, what do you what do you do to take care of yourself? Um, for me, nature helps. So being outside, um, you know, New York has a lot to offer. You can go up to the Hudson Valley. You can go out to Long Island to the beach. Um, you can go to Central Park. Right. Um, there are places to just be outside and feel the wind um, on your face and, and you know, be in, be in trees and kind of separate from the machinery that is immigration proceedings um, and just all the paper pushing that being an attorney can be sometimes, right? Just get outside. Um, so for me, th those things have been helpful. Um, uh, I would also um, say that, you know, thinking about the how to organize your time effectively can, can help reduce um, stress too. Now, stress isn't always related to vicarious trauma, but thinking about things like to-do lists and calendars, thinking, okay, if I want to sleep eight hours a day, I have 16 hours awake, you know, what's the best way to spend that time, right? If I want to meet with friends for an hour or two and um, and hang out and, and exercise for an hour, you know, I'll schedule that in. So it's it's right there and it's protected time. And then how much time do you want to spend meeting with clients versus writing briefs versus in court? And being intentional about your time is is something that I would I would say is important to think about early and often. Stephanie? Yeah, for me, I think I was, um, when I started working uh, with children, um, during the fellowship was the first two years of my career, I definitely was less intentional than I am now. Uh, but looking back, I think I was already doing some things that felt instinctual to protect myself. And I think uh, compartmentalizing was really important um, and keeping work at work and life outside of that um, and understanding. And again, going back to also what Alex was saying in terms of the uh, savior complex, um, understanding that the work that you're doing, um, yes, it is important, but it's also a small part of our clients' lives. And so not thinking that, I think realizing that and, and coming back to that was helpful to me to continue doing the work um, and not let it get overwhelming to hear everything that I was hearing because our clients are so much more than the stories and the harm and the pain that they have been through. Um, and so it's really focusing on the clients, learning from them. If they're resilient, then, you know, I can't be, and it happened to them, then I certainly have to be stronger. Um, although it's not always easy, obviously. Um, but again, the breaks really helped. Uh, having lunch with my colleagues, um, being able to talk with them about what I had just heard so that it comes out and it helps to process it better. Um, and then really trying to keep a schedule where we are not working on these very difficult 
or hearing or rewriting these stories during the weekends when you're supposed to take a break um, and keeping some distance and away from the stories because we can delve so deeply into them, but at the same time, it's important to get out of that um, and distance yourself when you are recovering so you can continue doing the work. Um, and yeah, so it was a combination of compartmentalizing for me um, and focusing on all the aspects that my clients were and not just its story. It helped me put things in perspective and not feel so deeply when I heard um, what they had gone through in the past. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, I think the, the landscape has changed a lot in terms of well-being. Well-being is well-doing. And for many years, we focused on our clients and forgot about the advocates, the advocates who continue to hear these stories, the advocates who, because of lived experience, um, are really impacted by what we are hearing. And I think in, we, we've come a long way in now recognizing that. And so in the fellowship itself, we provide group therapy sessions to the fellows. We also provide them with the um, wellness, um, mindfulness app, um, Headspace, and give room to make sure that they have the space to be able to say no sometimes when they're overwhelmed. When you have a lot of cases, you've done a hearing or two in a week and you feel overwhelmed, to be able to tell your supervisor, I need a mental day off, it's your right to ask for that. And so it's something that we have started to model a lot and hope that it will spread uh, to other organizations. So um, both of you currently occupy director level positions at your organizations. How did your fellowship experience prepare you for your current positions? Stephanie, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah, I'll get started. Um, I think in many ways, uh, I think that even in my current position, because the need is great, I'm continue to work with children, even if not exclusively. And I do think that the transition from working with children to then working with adults comes a bit easier than working with adults and then specializing um, in working with children. There are so many things that could be different and ethical issues that arise that um, it's just, I, for me, an easier transition. And so it helps me in supervising the work that I currently do um, and being a generalist that I am now, I think I'm only able to do that um, well enough is because I specialize working with children first. So I know what to look out for there, um, even uh, as I'm also working on supervising other work. I think my communication skills are all for the better. Um, after working with children, there is a lot of practicing of breaking down very complex ideas and concepts and consequences of cases, um, and then really hearing from the clients about what they think, even when they might wanna hear from you what you think about it. It's really helpful to start doing that with children. And then it just becomes so much easier to do that with adults who might well, they're definitely at a different level in their development, um, just biologically speaking. And and yeah, and with the ethical issues, so, you know, a great need out there as well is working with parents, adults with children who have come through and there are a lot of thorny ethical issues that are there in having that dual representation of representing the adults and maybe the children. And I think that my work with children really helped me be aware of those and account for those in that representation because it's really easy it's what I've seen to just uh, see that unit, the family unit and and forget that there are specific ways to work with children, you know, that you don't have to get all the information from the parents, that it is important to meet individually with the clients because the children, because they're also separately your clients. And so I think it better equipped me to be able to do this work now and to be and to have an eye for issues and be able to account for them as I'm supervising my team. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot there. A couple of things I learned from the IGC fellowship that's that's really helped as um as director of my deportation defense clinic and and in other ways is um so learning best practices from a high caseload I think can be helpful. You jump right in to IJC you know, probably you'll have a fair amount of cases and, and you really learn a lot by doing those cases. You, you learn different forms of relief, 
uh, some of those ethical issues, like Stephanie said, what if there's a conflict between a parent and child? How do you navigate that? Both, both in terms of legal ethics, but also just practically speaking, how do you sort it out to move forward with the case? Um, supervising interns was really valuable. So each summer we had we had interns that we would supervise and maybe volunteer for more throughout the year. That that supervision experience was helpful um, early on, and and still use. St I'm still in touch with some of those folks, and. Um, still use um, some of those skills today, supervising law students, um, learning how to manage up as an employee, right? And communicating with your supervisor about things that are going well and things that, you know, you need help with or room for improvement, I think is is an important skill. Um, and then lastly, I'll say community building within IJC and elsewhere is knowing who to go to when you have a question that maybe you can't answer in-house, right? And so, you know, there are um times in your career there certainly was for me um where you know you don't your supervisor or, or maybe you don't have a supervisor or your supervisor just hasn't handled that type of case hasn't done a t visa for instance for trafficking victims or something like that but you can go to somebody and and be both respectful of their time but also um you know ask maybe for a very specific issue that you just haven't encountered before and say you know i've i've done my research already you know so i'm not starting from scratch but i have you know, this this question that's come up that really nobody's been able to answer, how does this play out before USCIS or in court or something like that? And so I think knowing who to go to and having a community is something that really IJC instills in you that this is kind of a community approach to practicing law and that that's invaluable. I mean, having people to go to to talk about best practices, judges practice, and, um, and how to successfully move cases forward um, is really is really important. So th thank you for sharing. So being a manager has its own stresses uh, because you're managing staff, you're managing a caseload as well. So how do you, and, and I would be the first person to say I don't model well-being very well, but I'm trying. So as managers, how do you prevent burnout in your staff? What, what do you look out for? What are some of the things that you've put in place to avoid burnout? So many things come to mind. Um, I'll start with saying that, um, so I have been very intentional after learning from my experience and you're right, there has been a change in how we understand trauma and these conversations that need to be had while we are doing this work, not just as an aside, but building these skills to be able to do this work. It's not just about the legal skills, but also your self-care skills and commitment to that. Um, so I think one thing I do is kind of lead by example in a way. I think I'm very open about the fact that I go to therapy. I meet with my team weekly and there's space there to talk about how's everyone feeling, how not just about the work, but maybe about current events that still have an impact on our mental health because of the work that we do and the type of people that we are being in this uh, field. Um, and so just having the space for people to talk about that, checking in with staff regularly about um, how they're doing, but ask very directed questions like, what are your hours like? And, you know, are you going, are you um, taking time off on the weekend and even going around asking people what are your plans for the weekend? When are people taking vacation? Um, and just reminding everyone that this is an important part to acknowledge. Um, and on top of that, I think, you know, caseloads are an important thing to control to not add to the, the stress. Um, these There are a lot of factors that can add to burnout. Um, and so, ensuring that the caseloads are manageable by meeting with my team regularly, seeing what individual hearings are coming up and just being aware of that. Um, and yeah, I think that that's what I have done and just, again, bringing these conversations on a consistent ma manner, providing, and as Lisney Legal Services New York City, we also are intentional about that and providing trainings about how to deal with trauma and skills that our staff are gonna need in order to um, to be able to do this work sustainably, such as learning how to set boundaries with clients, 
set boundaries at work um, and ensure that they're protecting their mental health. Yeah, well said. Yeah, I think I, I also wrote down um, boundaries, um, uh, including like late night emails, right? Kind of, so sometimes that'll be an initial flag that'll say like, you know, are you a night owl or are you are you swamped, right? If some people like to work at night and that's fine, but but if it's that they're just so busy that they have to work very late, you know, that'll be something I'll check in on to make sure, you know, if that's happening, maybe we need to figure out how to move move things around, right? Like you might be overwhelmed. You shouldn't have to be working past midnight on on stuff. That's just, it's too much work for anybody. Um, so yeah, boundaries, other things, um, you know, talking to those that I supervise about what their goals are, what they're hoping to get out of the clinic. Are they are they hoping to get certain type of types of experience? And I, I find people usually enjoy the work more if they're meeting a goal that, you know, they're working on a case that they're interested in or they're gaining litigation experience or, or a writing sample, something that engages their own self-interest in the work in addition to, to doing deportation defense work. Um, vacation's important, um, you know, generally for staff, taking taking vacation days, even if folks don't think they need it, taking at least a day off, you know, um, I think is important. I, I grant extensions pretty liberally. Um, I'm strict about communication and professionalism. So I ask that folks, you know, ask for the extension, right? Before the deadline, ideally, right? Um, but then after that, I grant them pretty pretty frequently, right? And so people need more time, as long as it's not a court or government imposed deadline. If, if we just said, hey, could you write the brief by next week and things came up, you know, happy to grant an extension on it. Life comes up, totally understand, but just ask that folks communicate about that and say, hey, something came up, can, can I get an extension, right? And that's good practice. Same thing in court. You can ask for an adjournment sometimes, but you need good cause, right? And so similarly, just something came up, right? I, I have to attend a wedding or a funeral, but, you know, can I, um, can I, you know, have some additional time? No problem, right? So um, extensions, I'm totally, totally willing to consider. Um, I similarly, I teach a class on trauma and vicarious trauma, and I really try to flip some of the trainings I've been to where instead of spending three quarters of the time talking about trauma and one quarter on self-care, I try to do the opposite where I spend a quarter on like our clients have trauma. Here are the definitions. Here's what vicarious trauma is. Here's how you might experience it. And now let's talk about ways we can take care of ourselves, right? Because I find sometimes you leave those meetings and kind of the air is sucked out of the room where you feel like, oh my gosh. We're all so traumatized. If only there was something we could do about it. And then you go home and you don't really feel better, right? So thinking about um, what you can do about it um, is, is part of that class. Um, and caseloads and expectations, as Stephanie said, is important too. And um, what I like to often ask is, when, when do you want to be busy, right? Things are going to be busy this semester. Is it better for you at the beginning of the semester? Um, and then we can glide into finals more calmly. Or would you rather spend the time kind of learning, catching up on the law, and then towards the end of the semester, that's when your trial will be or something like that. But, you know, when when folks want to be busy, I think, and, and getting to choose that, hopefully to give some agency and can reduce stress. So th those are a couple a couple things um, that, I, that I would say. That's, that, that's, that's very, very um, instructive. Thank you so much. So the, the, we started this conversation talking about the need for representation. And know that the need for lawyers to provide represent quality representation to children is so acute. What advice would you both give to someone interested in pursuing an IGC fellowship and also working exclusively with children? Um, so number one, you, you should do it. You should apply to IJC um, if you haven't already or, or if you are. Um, you know, I think this is a really meaningful career where you can provide for yourself and your family while doing good work. Um, and uh, I don't think that's true of all careers, but I think as an immigration attorney, you can do both. You can make an, a positive impact in people's lives, um, try to advocate for systemic change and make a living, right? All of those things I think are important for folks, especially law students coming out of, of school. I know I'm not, you know, I, I remember what it's like where, where you need to pay off your loans if you have them and you need to get a job, right? Um, and um, other advice I would share for once you're in practice would be um, reach out to colleagues, um, get samples of documents that, that you can see how things have been done before. You don't always have to recreate the wheel, pay close attention to detail. Um, a lot of being an attorney is, is really looking at things closely. Um, uh, figure out how you're gonna organize 
some of those systems we talked about, your time, your tasks. Um, you know, if you're feeling frantic, I, I think, you know, um, you need to slow down and kind of think through um, what is it that's that's stressing? Is it total workload? Is it the uncertainty about the work that you just don't know how to do a task? And it's actually not the amount of time you're putting into it, but you need some advice, you need some training on it. Um, you know, again, to-do lists, I think are so important for me. Sometimes stress manifests, it's like hard to fall asleep because I'm just thinking about all the things I have to do. It's like, oh, in this case, oh, and then there's this thing coming up. And so what I find is get it out of my head and onto paper really helps for me personally. And so sitting down, making a to-do list, and then I know, okay, everything's like right here on this to-do list. I don't, I held up paper. I just can't see it through this bubble here. But, um, uh, you know, it's on paper as opposed to in my head. And, and for me, that's been really helpful as well. Um uh, so those those are a couple tips I would share with folks. Yeah, I think that was my first instinct as well is definitely do it. It has been such a rewarding experience and it has, I think, prepared me to be the kind of lawyer I am um, and be so client centered. I think it's wonderful that IJC is coming, has this program and ex is expanding the capacity to work with unaccompanied minors because it just makes sense to have this kind of representation and to not have this particular population face the immigration court system on their own. And so it's really just a wonderful thing to be contributing to that. Um, yes, it is challenging. Uh, so I would advise people to make sure that just as they're working on their legal writing skills, on learning the law, they also learn what works for them to take care of yourself and put your mental health first. This is important work, but nothing is more important than being okay yourself. Because if you are not, then you cannot do any kind of work at all. It's not selfish to think that way. It is just important and it's what needs to be done to be able to do not just this job, any job, but in particular this one. So don't put yourself second. And then keeping things in perspective, you know, talk to um, others who've done this work and also to maybe to your clients um, about what they're doing nowadays. I think just understanding, like I mentioned before, how we are a part of something way bigger, um, that our clients are more than their stories. I think just keeping things in perspective is going to, I think, help make it easier to hear these stories and not, you know, dwell um, as much on them or, or be stuck in them, especially if our clients are resilient and they actually are going um, and being and in the future, fulfilling their potential, regardless of what they went through. Um, so yeah, keep things in perspective and take care of yourselves. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Chris, do we have any questions from the audience? We sure do. And just a reminder to the audience, if you do have questions, please submit them in the Q&A box. We'll want to get to all of them. Uh, the first one, um, this is anonymous, but I feel it's for it's for Alex, but anyone, any of our speakers can take it. Uh, can you elaborate on what are some best practices for dealing with vicarious trauma? Yeah, and 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 I think um yeah I'm happy to happy to share that and and I'm sure Stephanie has um advice here too. I'll also say it's it's personal um and so you know I don't think I can give like the answer on what you should do about vicarious trauma right. I think that really comes from comes comes from you right. And so that's something that folks should think about um in terms of like what what helps you de stress um ideally again you know in a healthy way um what you know um helps re-energize you get you ready for the next day um and so you know i would say um things that i've i've heard a lot of of people report to me that that seem to work well are um uh time with community and friends and family um exercise being out outdoors nature um doing things that are just like just fun like not work and fun but just fun so like going to a concert um, playing like a game of, you know, pick up softball or whatever, right? Basketball, um, um, going for a hike, uh, listening to music, reading a book, reading fiction, not just immigration, right? I remember like early in my fellowship, they, they gave us professional development funds and I'm like, I'm going to get a bunch of immigration law books. And I got all these books and I started reading some of them and I was like, oh my gosh, that's the last thing I want to do when I get home is like, then pick up like, you know, a, a semi-fictional account or like a description of basically the same thing I did all day. And so I, I, I reframed after that and thought, okay, some books like, 
are secondary resources you need for legal research. Sure, get those. For fun books, just get a different book, right? It doesn't have to be about immigration. We're we're more than just immigration attorneys, right? And so like get a fictional book that's fun to read that about some place you've never been in the world or whatever, right? Um uh so th those are some things that I've heard from students consistently seem to help. Um you know, eating good food in New York, you know, I know not everyone is going to apply or is living in New York, but you know, if you live in a place with good food, I think food tourism is fun too. Like go try a new place every day. That's a, you know, or every week or every month or whatever. But, um, you know, there's, there's so much new, exciting things to do in a lot of the cities that, that we're placing fellows. I think go and um, go try some new stuff. Um, Stephanie, what do you think? Yeah, I think I agree. I think um, it, it's what you said is really important is to know that vicarious trauma, I think, hits people differently and might be happening for different reasons and different people. And so I think it's important to identify the source of that. I think that sometimes you have to understand what our triggers are. Why am I taking this um, to heart? Is it reminding me of something that I need to resolve um, through therapy? And so now next time I hear it, I think about it differently. Am um, I focusing on the not necessarily the wrong thing, but am I looking at this in a way that just is causing me more pain? Um, and is there a way to change that in therapy? I feel like understanding yourself well and then seeking the resources, like a group therapy is good, personal therapy. Um, I think that going to one of those two is really important. And I know it's not for everyone. So understanding what is a good fit for you. Thank you both. We have a number of questions from the audience. We'll do our best to get to all of them. Uh, our next question is, uh, it's, this is, so this is more about advocacy. In your experience, how just are child immigration laws and how does IJC empower you to influence change? I don't think they're just. I think that IJC empowers you to influence change um, because aside from your work in the host organization, there were a lot of opportunities to think about the larger picture and um, get involved in larger picture projects. And I think that was what was great about being in the fellowship is that we weren't just expected to do the work, but actually engage in conversations, webinars, trainings, um, you know, going to Carnes, which I think is still happening to the detention centers, um, and just see different aspects to the work. And so I think being part of the fellowship is a completely different experience than just starting at a job where maybe they're expecting you just to do the work. And if advocacy is not part of what your job or what that position does, you might not get those opportunities. Um, and I'm, I'm sure things have gotten uh, even better in terms of those opportunities, particularly now that there's this new project of working specifically with unaccompanied minors. But yeah, I relied a lot on IJC and the programming to think outside the box and see what others are doing. And so that could inspire my work and ways to challenge um, things in my in my specific position. Yeah, I, I yeah, I agree. I think the laws are not just the fact that, you know, it's it's kind of the opposite of what we all learn from shows like Law and Order that um you know, in immigration court, you're not entitled to an attorney unless you can find a, you're lucky enough to find a free attorney or you can afford a private attorney. And so, you know, I think we've all represented kids that can't see above the bench that we're sitting at and yet are expected to defend themselves in court against an ICE attorney. I mean, it's incredibly unfair. And what I often say in class is, you know, there's this presumption in the law that ignorance of the law is no excuse, right? Um, and And therefore, I, my normative opinion, right, is that we should have laws that are simple and transparent so anyone can abide by them. But I think anyone who's practiced immigration law knows nothing is further from the truth, that our laws are opaque, complicated, hard to navigate, even for attorneys, let alone for, for children, um, young people and, and, and clients at large. Um, and, um, you know, it, it really creates a lot of challenges in, in a variety of different ways. So they're not just we want to bring about changes to them, um, you know, and we need Congress's help, unfortunately, for a lot of that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with both of you. And I think that um, I would say it's a very unfair system, a system that requires children if who do not speak English 
to represent themselves if they can't afford counsel. But I think the advocacy we do is across the board. We do our advocacy trying to change the system. We also sometimes are doing advocacy for our clients. In some situations, our client is just not ready to go forward with a removal case, for example. And we are trying to slow down the process as much as possible and take care of the person's either mental health issues or other issues that they are having in their personal lives at home before they would even be able to help us think through with them how to present their case. So the advocacy is on so many levels. And I think um, as part of the fellowship, we see it on different occasions. Um, sometimes you have an organization that is doing some work on the legislative level to either make sure that the uh, children are able to get employment authorizations, for example, even before they get lawful status. So um, very open to different ways of advocating for children. Thank you all for your answers. Uh, the next question is more about the, um, the ecosystem of immigration legal service providers. As, as we all know, in addition to attorneys, there are accredited representatives, paralegals, social workers who are involved in this work. Uh, the question is, what can a paralegal do to assist with helping unaccompanied minors or children in immigration proceedings? Yeah, I mean, I think we need all hands on deck. Um, and so I think paralegals play play such an important role, accurately um, communicating with clients, getting evidence and, and facts, um, you know, reporting issues as you encounter them um, to attorneys or whoever your supervisor is um, helping. I know, you know, in, in our in the organizations I've worked for, paralegals help with legal screenings, sometimes with employment authorization um, applications or other other filings. Um, you know, calling the court, which sounds like a small thing, but it's actually like very important helping get client files and communicating with, with judges, clerks and, and with ICE attorneys. Um, so I, I think paralegals can help in all the same way an attorney um, can help um, oftentimes in terms of case management. Um, and, you know, and, um, and then consider too, like your next steps. And if, if, if law school's on that horizon, then planning for the future to be the best attorney you can. And if not, than being the being the best paralegal you can. Um, so yeah, absolutely. There's certainly a place. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. So apologies if, if we haven't gotten to yours, but we, we have one question. Um, hello, where can small community organizations trying to build capacity to represent children secure the best resources to obtain templates to guide and supplement our work? Um, I'm part of the, um, and people doing this work, I think should be part of the um, listserv for special immigrant juvenile, but it's called the NY SIG listserv that is managed by the Legal Aid Society, Christina Romero in particular. Um, there's a lot of basically organizations across the state doing that kind of work, doing this work and who share materials and tips. Um, and so I think it's important to be part of that. And you can reach out to me um, if you want me to connect you with uh, Tina Romero, but um, maybe not the most efficient, but it's definitely a good way because so many people are on it. Yeah, yeah, I think listservs are a great idea, talking to experts. And then I'll say also, I think one thing that people don't always talk about um, with samples that we should is you can develop your own in-house samples by by just doing a, a good job of retaining all the casework that you do in an organized way in-house, right? So go to experts and listservs, but then also if one of your colleagues wins a really hard case, save that brief, right? And maybe you have another religious-based asylum case coming up or another challenging SIGE case that's contested. And then over time, the longer your small organization is in practice, the more samples you'll get. And you'll say, oh yeah, like we have a whole folder on that type of case. So I would say in-house retention um, is another good way to build samples, but but all those things. Chris, we are at 1.30. So Stephanie and Alex, thank you so much for your inspiring work in ensuring that immigrant children have a trusted advocate beside them when they face a judge. Um, I'm hopeful that because of your experience and what you've shared with us this afternoon, 
many in our audience who are considering careers in immigration will join IJC to continue this work. Our goal next year is to place 140 plus lawyers in the immigration field. And we welcome all of you on this call who are looking to join the uh, legal profession to think of IJC, we need you. And give us two years and we will make you great lawyers. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.